there's a bar in the middle, and this is from the top-down view, but if we were actually able to see it from, you know, if we were to rotate it, we can actually see it closer to where we actually look at it within the Milky Way. We see it as a disk that is turned on its side, so it looks like a plane, right, uh, or a line across the sky, and some of that light is being blocked by dust, right? So this is what we're seeing, and this is what you can see if you can see both the northern and the southern hemispheres at the same time. So here's another picture, um, and you know the Milky Way is full of stars. There's a, more of them right in the middle, but there, you can see some of them that are closer to us here, and then there's some known objects, the Pleiades and the Orion constellation, right? So as humans, we have tried to make um, sense of the stars for you know, however long there's been humans on, on the Earth, and we've drawn these constellations, and a, a kind of a vision that we've had, and even like when you see pictures of astronomy, it's, it's pictures, it's snapshots in time. And the way we've been thinking about it is that basically everything is very static, right? We're taking pictures, nothing's really moving. And there's an entire new paradigm shift now. We're actually able to clock the motions of stars, and all of a sudden, the Milky Way will come to life. So the, the main new piece of information that we're getting is coming from this Gaia satellite in particular. Um, Gaia is monitoring billions of stars, about a billion stars, around um, 70 times each over five years. So it's like you're averaging over 40 million observations, right? That gets a lot of data that's coming out. And what Gaia is able to do is actually track how stars are moving across our line of sight. So they can see an individual star move with respect to some background that's not moving very much. And because it can track its motion as a function of time, you get a change in motion over time, which gives you a speed. So this is how Gaia and the Hubble Space Telescope is able to make measurements a star, like this is Barnard's star, it's actually pretty close to us, and it has a huge velocity across our line of sight. So we see it moving even though the background stars aren't moving very much because they're further away. So we can make these types of measurements. This is an extreme example because you can see the change just by your eye, but the measurements that they're making are really, really tiny. And then, like I said, essentially the Milky Way will come to life. So if you look carefully, you'll see that these stars are actually moving. And these are based on measurements from the Gaia Space Telescope of a million stars. And then we're able to forward model where they'll be in the future. So all of a sudden, the Milky Way is no longer a static thing they were just taking one picture of. Right? These stars are moving around. You can see this one zipping by there. And these ones are going over this way. Right? And we get a sense now of our Milky Way galaxy as an evolving structure. Right? And I think this is an important, different way of thinking about our night sky as, as something that's almost alive, right? It's moving around, it's changing, evolving with time. So what this actually means is when we think back at constellations, right, as these kind of drawings we've made in the sky to associate stars with one another, one of the most famous ones is the Orion um, constellation. So you have these two stars, the three characteristic ones in the middle, and then there's uh, Betelgeuse up here. And if you look closely, Betelgeuse is moving away from us here. This is a uh, projection over the next 450,000 years um, where these stars will go. And all of them, what's happening is the constellations are changing. That star is gone. It's still someplace over there. Other stars that are bright are coming into it. So even constellations, we think of them as associated stars, but they're not. They're actually quite far apart, and they have different velocities. And we know now which way they're moving. And so we can actually see how our night sky will change as a function. So this is all cool, you know, you can make maps of the night sky, but what we're really after, or at least what I'm after, is understanding dark matter. That's what I want to know about. So, you know, the way we think about motions, one of the easiest ways to make the analogy is to think about our solar system. So we have the sun, and we have planets that are orbiting around the sun. Now the rate at which they're moving, the velocities that they have, are dependent on the mass of the sun. So if you change the mass of the sun, you'll change how fast the planets will move, right? So here's another, way of thinking about it, and we don't need to get into the details of this, but you can think about space-time curving. If you have a heavier thing in the middle, if the sun is more massive, you'll get a deeper potential. And basically, in order to stop rolling down into this well, you have to move faster, right? So the only thing I want you to take away from this is that the motions of objects tell you something about how massive the central source is, right? So in this case, the motions of the planets tell you about the mass of the sun. And what I want to do is use the motions of stars to tell me about the mass of our Milky Way. Right, that's the idea. 
Now, people have been doing this for quite a while. Um, there's very famous work that was led by Vera Rubin, um, and Vera did fantastic measurements that really showed to the community that stars within our Milky Way galaxy and various other galaxies are rotating. And this is an example of an external galaxy, and what she did is made measurements of the speed that these stars are moving towards us or away from us, and she made a plot of it. And then she said, okay, well, like I said, the motions of stars tell us something about the mass. So she said, okay, well, the speeds are this high, and look, they keep staying really high. That means there has to be a lot more mass there than stars. Because we can make a prediction of, let's like, say, we add up all the stars in this galaxy, and we can say the speed should be like this. But we're observing much higher speeds. And if you observe a fast speed, this means there's more mass there's not that many more stars. So from this, we inferred the existence of some sort of unseen material, right, that doesn't interact with light in any obvious way. Um, and that is what we refer to as dark matter, right? So I'm not in this talk gonna get into the weeds of what dark matter is, because, surprise, we don't know, right? Um, but we're working on it. Um, but what I want to get at is another way that we're thinking about it, which is just, let's constrain how much there is, and then from there, maybe we can develop models to explain what it actually is, right? So as astronomers, we are currently trying to use the motions of stars um, and other objects that are orbiting around our Milky Way to understand the distribution and the total amount of dark matter um, that is in and around our galaxy. So we can turn to theorists who have developed models for what they think dark matter, what the distribution of dark matter should be. And um, these folks have made a lot of really awesome movies of galaxies and structure forming. This has frozen on me, but I will try and see through this. And so what you can see then is that all of the stuff that you're looking at here is dark matter. Um, and it is distributed in roughly a spherical distribution, maybe in the middle regions, but then in the outskirts, maybe it's a little bit more, you know, along this direction. We refer to collectively all of this dark matter that is surrounding, that you can see here, as a halo, right? So it's just like a bunch of material that is surrounding our Milky Way. And what's interesting is if you actually put the Milky Way in there, it would be this like yellow dot, right, in the center. So all the stars that we see are a very small component of the full dark matter distribution that we actually think is there in our Milky Way. So there's supposed to be a lot of this stuff. That's really the main point. There's a lot of it, and it's clumpy. There's a bunch of little small things kind of all over the place, and these small things are orbiting around the center of this system. We refer to these as satellites. And the prediction from the theory is that, yes, there should be dark matter all around our Milky Way, and some of it should be clumped into individual objects that are orbiting within this Milky Way halo of dark matter and we're referring to those as satellites. So they should be there, so then the theorists go turn to the observers and they say, go find them. And we say they should be there. So now all of a sudden it's the job of all the people using telescopes, right? I'm around with theorists, right? So I can make all the models and say, oh, go look for them. <laughs> so this idea isn't so crazy because we can actually start looking at our night sky and trying to see, are there galaxies, like big things that are orbiting around or moving around our Milky Way? And if you go to the southern hemisphere, Southern night sky, two very prominent examples are there right away. Very easy to see with the naked eye if you go to a sky zone, which is very dark. This is taken in the Patagonia region in Argentina. Here's our Milky Way with the dust that is blocking some of the light. This is the comet McNaught that was fortuitously passing by when this picture was taken. And here, these two objects, this is the large and the small Magellanic cloud. These two galaxies, they're actually galaxies, they are orbiting around our Milky Way. And so we've actually known since there were humans right in the Southern Hemisphere that there are other objects there. Um, and in fact, the Milky Way is not alone. It does actually have at least two objects that are orbiting around us. So I want to take a little bit of a closer look at the larger of the two galaxies, the large Magellanic Cloud. So this galaxy is small in comparison to our own Milky Way but still big enough and close enough to us that people from many different civilizations in the Southern Hemisphere have known about them. Right? We refer to them as the Magellanic Clouds um, in, in Western society, but of course they had different names by different peoples in the, south, in 
the southern hemisphere. Um, and so the structure of this galaxy is a little weird. It's got this big bar, um, and there are stars that are up here and around here. It looks pretty disordered. Um, and this is a, known as an irregular type galaxy. And it's given that name because it looks not regular. <laughs> nothing much more complicated than that. Um, so the most prominent structure, as I mentioned, is this bar. This is another image of the same galaxy, and it is in fact my favorite image of this galaxy. Um, and you can see right here, this is the bar that I just showed you in the previous image. Now obviously this isn't as impressive as the last one, right? So it doesn't look like, so, like all that much. But what makes this image so amazing is not about the quality of the image itself, but rather where it was taken from. It was taken by the Spirit Rover on Mars. So they, you know, got the camera pointed it upwards. So it's the first example of extragalactic astronomy being done on another planet, which I thought was kind of cool. All right, so we have known about the large and small Magellanic clouds for a long time. And so it's starting to um, be a movie that I'll show you as time has progressed since 1920 is where this starts. Like I mentioned, we've known about these two for a long time. Um, there's going to be many more of discoveries of satellite galaxies, these small things that are orbiting around our Milky Way. bright systems that we've been able to see um, with most ground-based observatories. So again, we're still like now entering the 2000s, and this is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is what gave you these red ones. And then most recently, it was the Dark Energy Survey, which looked at the south, and that gave you all these green ones. So we started with two, and we're now up to about 50. So these are distinct galaxies. They're orbiting around our Milky Way. And so many, so many of them are actually only recently discovered. And now we have space observatories like Gaia that are going to tell us exactly how fast each one of these points are moving. And so the idea is that if we can clock how fast they're moving, we can start to say how much mass must there be to make them move so quickly. Right? So um, this is what my team has been doing. We've been creating simulations um, and actually trying to track the motions all of these satellites. So these were the classical ones. These were the ones discovered prior to 1999. Um, and we can, we've known about these ones for a while. They're the brightest systems on the sky. Here's the large and small Magellanic clouds. So what you're looking at here is the Milky Way's in the middle. These are where all these points are today. And then we're looking backwards in time. Where did they come from? Right, so some of them have been around for a while. Right, it's a few billion years about two billion years. And then some of them, like the large and the small Magellanic clouds, look like they've come in fairly recently into our neighborhood. But like I said, in the era of Gaia, we have more satellites now. And um, we can also do the same exercise. And now all of a sudden, we have all of these objects moving in all sorts of different directions. And we're gonna, there's just so much more data. And so we're gonna try to use this mess of different motions of all these things to try and understand where did all of these satellites come from, right? When, and what do they tell us about the dark matter distribution around our Milky Way? Right, so we want to try and link, this is what the dark matter distribution might look like. Each of these points would be represented by one of these smaller points here, right? And in some ways, we hope that the motions, how fast they're moving, tell us about how all of this light pink stuff here is distributed, right? So people have tried to do this already with the motions that we have at the moment. And the numbers are kind of all over the place to a certain extent, right? So this is uh, a plot that's actually from a, uh, a paper by Professor Guainini, who is a professor at the University of Toronto. Um, and what this is is just showing you how much mass, how much of this dark mass in particular, is there as a function of distance away from the center of the Milky Way. And the only thing I want you to take away from this is it's kind of scattered. And you can see these error bars are pretty big. But really what this boils down to is we actually know the Milky Way's total dark matter mass to be on the order of a trillion times the mass of the sun. Right, so um, but we know it's within a factor of two, which is actually pretty good. <laughs> I mean, so especially as a theorist, I do like orders of magnitudes. For me, like an error bar of like a factor of 100 is like amazing. So a factor of two, I'm like, you're joking. This is fantastic. <laughs> the issue is that a factor of two is still a problem. So, as I showed you these plots of this dark matter distribution, there's all these small systems all around the Milky Way here, or this dark matter distribution. 
Um, you'll notice there's a lot more of these dots than there are of these dots. So there's a mismatch between these two um, predict like the predictions and the observing on the observations. So the theory is we refer to this as the missing satellite problem. We're like we predicted way more satellites, observers are just not finding them. And the satellite and the observers they call this the overabundance of satellites problem. <laughs> We've just made too many, not more problem, right? So there's sort of battle between the two, and in the end the answer is kind of both sides are right. So here's another um, example of this distribution of dark matter uh, that could exist around a galaxy, and the bright points here are telling you where there could be satellite galaxies. And by that, we just mean they have stars, right? That would actually be seen. And if you say, okay, let's put in some models that actually account for how stars form over time, how many of these dots should actually have stars in them? Right, should all of them? And what we're turning out, the answer is that not all of them should. Some of them are just too small. And so in the end, you may actually come up with the stars would actually look much simpler. There's only a few bright things around. And all of a sudden, we get closer to the numbers that we're actually seeing. So part of the answer is, yeah, there actually aren't as many things. Of, some, not all of those clumps of dark matter should have stars in them. So that's part of the answer. But that factor of two uncertainty is still a problem. This is just one model, but if the Milky Way were two trillion times the mass of the sun, there will still be too many of these bright dots around. Whereas if it's just a trillion times the mass of the sun, we're okay. So literally this problem with a factor of two. So we're trying to, we're in a regime now where it actually is a precision measurement we're trying to get out. And that's the challenge right now. This is why the quality of the data matters so much. So, but in principle, we have all of these satellite galaxies, we have all of their motions, so why isn't this just a solved problem? The reason it's not a solved problem is because of that large Magellanic cloud. So this is the area of research that I work on. Um, I like to cause problems with theories, it's a lot of fun. Um, and so what I've been working on, and my team's been working on, is saying that this is our Milky Way here, this is the large and small Magellanic cloud that I showed you, Mr. Remember in the South. Right? They're not that far away from us. They're only about 160,000 light years. And they're a lot bigger than we think. So right now they kind of look like two little blobs over here, but like just look at the gas that's associated with them. So right now what we're looking at is just stars. There are stars in both of these galaxies, but the gas, particularly hydrogen gas, looks like this. There's a lot more material there than we're really seeing. So there's this huge stream of gas trailing behind them. There's a bridge that connects them. There's all this stuff out here. So when you look at it in the gas, it starts to look a lot more important, right? There's a lot more material that's there. And my team has also been working on trying to understand where these galaxies came from, how long have they been around our Milky Way. And it turns out that with new measurements from the Hubble Space Telescope, we've been able to clock exactly how fast these galaxies are moving. And we've tried to figure out where they came from, and they don't seem to have been around for very long. So in the past, we always thought they've been going around and around our Milky Way for a long time. So they've always been companions to us. But with the new measurements of how fast they're moving, it actually looks a lot more like this blue line, where they're coming out from much further distances over the same period of time. So these are new interlopers into our Milky Way galaxy. And they're bringing with them a lot of stars, a lot of gas, and a lot of dark matter. Now this is where it starts to get to the point where we're testing theories. The theory says, if systems, if dark matter exists, dark matter should exist in all systems that have a substantial amount of stars and gas, including the large and small Magellanic clouds. Okay, so if dark matter exists, the LMC should be bringing in dark matter of its own. So this is an image that's showing you the distribution of dark matter before the LMC came in. The only thing to take away from this is that there are circles and the circles are pretty much symmetric, right? So we're just assuming that everything is just a sphere. So this is a toy model that we've been creating. Let's think of everything as simple, on average, roughly a sphere. Then the LMC comes in. 50 million years ago, the LMC was over here. The Milky Way would be right in the center over here. And all of a sudden, you see these are no longer spheres. And then, at the present day, the LMC moves over here, and now it's the distribution is looking even more twisted and over in a different direction. So over a period of about 50 million years, the distribution of dark matter changed. No, 
Now, 51 years seems like a lot of time, right? It's a long amount of time, but on the time scales that we're talking about for objects orbiting around our Milky Way, that's actually kind of the worst amount of time. It's exactly perfectly designed to disrupt everything. And here's just an example. So this is the dark matter distribution around our Milky Way. Here's the LMC with its own dark matter distribution. And these two lines are showing you one case, let's ignore the LMC entirely, and the other case, let's put it in. You get different answers for where objects are gonna move to. So if you ignore the LMC, you're gonna get the wrong answer. And so this is what my team is trying to work with the community to try and understand is if the theory says that there should be dark matter, there has to be dark matter in the LMC. It's not that small, which means that when it comes in for the first time, maybe about a billion years ago, it's gonna move things around. And if we don't account for that, we're gonna get the wrong answer for what the total amount of material there is around the Milky Way, right? So we wanna measure the motions of satellites, include the LMC, and then we'll be able to actually get out how much mass in dark matter is there and how is it distributed. So we wanna beat down this factor of two uncertainty. Now, if we can do that, if we can actually get out an, an estimate for the mass of our Milky Way, we can start to make models for what's gonna happen for the future of our Milky Way galaxy. And the future of our galaxy could be very dramatic indeed. And the culprit there is the Andromeda galaxy. So our Milky Way is not alone. We have, yes, all these satellite galaxies that are orbiting around it, but also we have another massive galaxy on the order of the same mass as our own Milky Way that you can actually see. And this is an object that you can see in the Northern Hemisphere. So Andromeda also has a satellite galaxy of its own. This is called Triangulum, which is interestingly enough, kind of like the LMC. So these galaxies are about 2.6 million light years away from us. So really, really far away, right? But the problem is, however, that this galaxy is coming straight towards us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is the correct reaction. <laughs> so we have, this is an image of what Andromeda would look like on the night sky if you could actually see its full extent. So here's the full moon for reference. It's actually really big on the sky already. It's just that most of these stars are too faint to see. But like I said, it's coming directly towards us. And we know this because we've measured its speed using the Hubble Space Telescope. And interestingly, we only did this in 2012. So before that, we didn't really know. Like, we knew it was coming at us, but we didn't know it was coming straight at us. <laughs> and now we've measured it, and it really is coming straight at us. So it's pretty interesting that this is happening. But again, if we can get models of dark matter, we can start to say when these events were going to happen. And our current estimate is that this collision between Andromeda and our Milky Way is going to happen in 4 billion years. Whoa. Um, but you may ask, the universe is expanding, right? This is what Gabe got the Nobel Prize of fairly recently. We know that objects are moving away from one another. In fact, they're not just expanding, they're accelerating their motions away from one another. So if everything's expanding, why is there a collision between two galaxies, right? And the answer is dark matter. So you have these two galaxies, the Andromeda Galaxy and our Milky Way. And if there were no dark matter, these two systems would be so far apart from one another that they would just fly apart along with the expansion of the rest of the universe. That's what would happen. But remember, there's all of this unseen mass that I can depict as big spheres around these two galaxies. And because of that, that means their attraction to one another is very high. And in fact, it's higher than this expansion rate for the universe. So even though everything else is moving away from each other, these two galaxies will overcome that and come back right at each other. All right, so really it boils down to dark matter. So this again is why we need to get that amount of dark matter down for our Milky Way because this is gonna govern when this type of interaction is gonna happen. And um, in the near future, we're gonna have a number of measurements for the Andromeda galaxy as well for all the satellites that are orbiting around it. And we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna try and get an estimate of how much of this dark matter is around this galaxy too. And then it'll be really fun to revisit this question. But at any rate, we're gonna do it anyways for now with the information that we have. So we have a set up a simulation, um, and this is basically an attempt to model what the future of our Milky Way is gonna look like. So 
So we have here the Andromeda galaxy. This is our Milky Way, and as I mentioned, Andromeda has a satellite of its own called Triangulum or M33. So. So we're going to start with our Milky Way galaxy. Let's see if I can move this out of the way. We're zooming in there. So it is a spiral galaxy. It is rotating. Right? So stars in there are moving as dictated by the distribution of dark matter. We zoom out. And then there is the Andromeda galaxy with its companion, M33. So these two galaxies will be starting at the present day. We have their speeds map. We have estimates of the dark matter distribution. So we can predict the way they will move towards one another in the future. So then at about 4 billion years or so, these two galaxies are going to go straight through one another. And this will form structures that we call tidal debris. So there'll be bridges and tails of material that will be stripped out of both galaxies. But these two galaxies, even though they've gone through one another, are going to come right back because they are then gravitationally bound and really the fate is sealed. And so what's going to happen in the end, the leftover material is just going to form what we refer to as an elliptical galaxy. So changing the distribution of stars from something that is a rotating disk into something that is more like a spheroid. Um, and those stars will then age and get older, depicted by the yellowing of the color, right? So the stars are cooler and they'll be redder in color. And interestingly, M33 is not going to care that much. It's <laughs> more of it around and has avoided the bulk of the, the damage that's been done. All right, so let's go back over here. 